Today we're going to discuss inhomogeneous media. in the context of geometrical optics. So what we're first gonna do, we're gonna start with Maxwell's equations. And we're gonna derive from them geometrical optics in a rigorous manner. Now to do so, we're gonna use the idea of phasers. And that is, if we have an electric field, which is a function a position in space r and time t and if that time dependence is sinusoidal well then we can write that as the real part of a complex vector field e which is only a function of position times a complex exponential and we're going to write that as e to the minus i omega t now by the way, so this brings up an important point, e to the minus i omega t, that is, we'll call that the physics notation. We use i for the imaginary unit and for time dependence, e to the minus i omega t versus e to the j omega t, which we'll call the engineers or engineering. notation. So we're going to use, in this course, the physics notation. Optics is a highly interdisciplinary field. You've got physicists and engineers, especially electrical engineers, uh, involved in that. And you'll see in journals and textbooks, etc., either of these two notations. Sometimes you'll even see Combinations like e to the minus j omega t or e to the plus i omega t, etc. So we're going to use the physics notation e to the minus i omega t for time dependence. So in that case, if you have sinusoidal time dependence, the electric field can be written as the real part of this complex vector field, phasor field, e of r times e to the minus i omega t, and likewise for the magnetic field h. Now, just uh, roughly speaking here, if you look at this, if you have something in the physics notation, you can replace I by minus J, and you'll get the engineering notation. And if you have something in the engineering notation, replace J by minus I, and you get the physics notation. Now, with this, we're then going to have, uh, in general, for Maxwell's equations, with sinusoidal time dependence, we'd be solving for these vector phasor fields, E and H, which are functions of position. Now, what we're going to assume is that this phasor field, E of R, can be written as another phasor field, little e of R, times E to the I, K, times the scalar function, S of R. And likewise for H. going to be little h of r e to the i k s of r and we're going to assume that right because obviously uh, there's no loss of generality in here because little e of r could just be equal to big e of r and then this could just be e to the zero uh, so it's completely general but we're going to hope that it is the case we're going to assume it is the case that little e of r and little h of r have slow variations in space. They vary slowly. Whereas e to the i k s of r, this phase factor, has rapid variations. And this comes from the reasonable assumption that when you get to 
very high frequencies or very small wavelengths. The phase varies quite rapidly in space, but the amplitude and polarization tends to vary much more slowly. So, with that assumption, and where k here represents omega over c, which is 2 pi over the wavelength in free space, we'll call lambda 0. Okay, so lambda 0 here is the free space wavelength. And the geometrical optics limit is going to be when k goes to infinity, or equivalently, lambda 0 goes to 0. The frequency in hertz, which we'll denote as nu, is omega over 2 pi. Right? So that's in hertz, not radians per second. And lambda 0 is the speed of light c over that frequency nu. The scalar function, which is also a real function of space, S of R, we're going to call the optical path. And note that it is real. So we're trying to separate out the magnitude and polarization from phase variations here. Optical path, let's see, well... K is 2 pi over free space wavelength, so it has units of inverse meters, so S must have units of meters, so it is indeed in terms of meters. We'll look at this a little more later on in more detail. Now, in order to manipulate Maxwell's equations when we're representing the fields as a vector times a scalar function, we need the following identity. comes from vector calculus, and that is this. The curl of a scalar f times a vector a is equal to the scalar times the curl of the vector plus the gradient of the scalar cross the vector. And of course, because Maxwell's equations involve curls of electric and magnetic fields, and we're representing those fields in this form of a vector times a scalar, this will be very important for us. The two Maxwell's equations we're interested in are Faraday's law that says that the curl of E is equal to I omega mu h in physics notation, and Ampere's law in a source-free region, so there's no free current flowing, curl of H is equal to minus I omega epsilon E. And because E and H, big E and big H, uh, are represented as a product of little e and little h times the scalar function E to the I K S R, we're going to need for our, our identity the gradient of E to the I K, S of R. And so let's see, what would that look like? Well, when we do that, right, the gradient is the first element. The X component is the X derivative. The Y component is the Y derivative, etc. So if we look at the X derivative of E to the I, K, S of R, what's that going to be? Well... It's e to the i, k. The derivative of an exponential is the exponential. And then we have the chain rule. The derivative of this exponent with respect to x is going to be i, k, times the x derivative of s. And uh, likewise for the y and z components. And so, well, that's going to be the, you're going to get the same factors for the y and z components. The only difference is going to be where you have the derivative with respect to x of s, you'll have the derivative with respect to y, and so on. So what you end up with here then is this is equal to i k, the gradient of s, because what's the x component of the gradient of s? Well, that's the x derivative of s. The y component is the y derivative of s, etc. 
times your original exponential, e to the i k s of r. So now we have the curl of e using our identity. We'll have an e to the i k s times the curl of little e, and then plus the gradient of this scalar factor cross e. And that gradient will be, well, you'll have the e to the i k s of r factor here we pulled out. So we'll have plus i k, the gradient of s, this is here, cross e. And that's equal to i omega mu little h e to the i k s. Of course, e to the i k s can be canceled from both sides. And then for the curl of h, very similar expression. Curl of little h plus i k gradient of s cross h is now equal to minus i omega epsilon little e and the scalar function e to the i k s. And again, those scalar functions cancel on both sides. So now we're going to divide both equations by i times k, which appears here and there. And remember that k is equal to omega over c. So if we do that and rearrange terms a little bit, in the first case, we're going to get the gradient of s across e. That's going to be this term after we divide by i k. Let's move this term over to the left. So it's going to look like minus c mu h. Why is that? We're dividing i omega mu by i k, which is i omega over c. So the i omegas cancel, and we're just left with mu over 1 over c, which is mu c. And then a minus sign because we move it over to the other side. And then we'll take this curl of little e, which is divided by i k, and move it over to the right. So that will be then equal to minus the curl of little e over i k. And we'll do a similar thing here with the curl of h equation. We'll get curl of s cross h from this guy, move this over to the other side, and that, so the minus will become a plus. We'll get plus, in this case, c epsilon little e, because the i omega cancels there. And then moving th this term over to the right, that will give us a minus the curl of little h over i k. And now, we're interested in the limit that the frequency goes to infinity, which means k, which is frequency over the speed of light, goes to infinity. And of course, that would mean that the free space wavelength would go to zero. And so in that case, the only place k appears in these equations is in these denominators. And if we assume that the curl of little e and the curl of little h remains bounded as k goes to infinity, then these right sides would both go to zero. And that's the geometrical optics limit. Infinite frequency, zero wavelength. So solving for little h, we have that it's equal to the gradient of s cross e over c times mu and little e is equal to minus the gradient of s cross h over c epsilon. Now, the cross product of two vectors is orthogonal to both those vectors. Therefore, h is orthogonal to e, e is orthogonal to h, and both are orthogonal to the gradient of s. And that would mean that, say this was our little e, then little h would be orthogonal to that. And they would both be orthogonal 
to the gradient of S. So three mutually orthogonal vectors. In electromagnetic theory, the pointing vector, which can be written as one half, the real part of E cross H conjugate, technically this would be the time average pointing vector, uh, would be in our case, well, let's see, just using these two expressions for E and H, that would be, we'd have one over two C mu from the H expression. And then this would be E cross conjugate of this expression here s is a real function so its conjugate is just equal to itself but you would have then the conjugate of the e so gradient of s cross e conjugate so over in this little diagram where is the gradient of s cross e that would be the cross product of these two vectors and that would be in the direction of h gradient of s cross e And therefore, let's see, we're, let's work this out. What would be this, this direction? So gradient of S cross E would be in the H direction. Then you've got E cross that. So E cross this would be in the direction of gradient of S. So your pointing vector, which represents the intensity of the field, the power flow, watts per square meter, would be in the direction of the gradient of s. So now we have a physical interpretation of the gradient of s. And let's work out the magnitudes. Here, well, this would just be 1 over 2 c mu. And because they're all orthogonal, uh, you just got the product of these magnitudes. So that's e times e conjugate. That's the magnitude of e squared. And then times gradient of s. So that gives you the power flow in the geometrical optics limit. It's proportional to the magnitude squared of the electric field and the gradient of S, the gradient of this called the optical path. Now let's take this equation and plug this equation over here into that to solve for E. We get E is equal to minus the gradient of S cross H, and now let's put this in for H, that's the gradient of S cross E, and then we've got these two factors, C epsilon and C mu, so that's C squared mu epsilon. And what would that be? Okay, so the gradient of S cross E is in this direction of H, and then the gradient of S cross that would be in the direction of minus E, and then you got a minus sign there, so that'd put it in the direction of E. And so in, therefore, you got a vector that's in the direction of E, and the magnitudes, which, because these are all orthogonal, would just be the magnitude squared of the gradient of S and the magnitude of E. So this ends up being just the magnitude of the gradient of s squared over c squared mu epsilon times e. So e is equal to some scalar factor times e. And of course that means that that scalar factor has got to be equal to 1. Now what is the gradient of s squared? The gradient of s squared would just be The x derivative of s squared plus the y derivative of s squared plus the z derivative of s squared. And so now taking this expression here, we have that the, the gradient of s squared over c squared mu epsilon is equal to 1. So the gradient of s squared is equal to c squared mu epsilon. Mu epsilon. 
And let's see, c squared is, well, we can write that, at, well, that's the speed of light in free space. So that's one over mu zero epsilon zero. Right? Speed of light, c is equal to one over the square root of mu zero epsilon zero. So c squared is one over mu zero epsilon zero. And then on top, you got mu epsilon. And that's just the definition of the square of the index of refraction. So we get an equation. Magnitude squared of the gradient of S is equal to N squared, or taking the square root of both sides, the magnitude of the gradient of this thing we call the optical path is equal to the index of refraction. And that's called the Iconal equation. Icon, the Greek word from which we get the word I-C-O-N, icon, is refers to an, an image. Um, and that can be taken to be the basic equation of geometrical optics. And, well, it looks rather abstract. It is right now. Let's we'll kind of work out what this means. So let's imagine we have some surface. Or, of course, we're writing as a two-dimensional form here. It's just a curve, but this would represent some surface in space where S is equal to S0. It's constant on that surface. Then, of course, the gradient of S would be perpendicular to that surface. The gradient of S is the direction of the greatest increase in S, and, of course, S does not change at all along that surface, and therefore the gradient of S would be 0 along that tangent to that surface. So the Greatest increase must be perpendicular. Now, a change in S, dS, would be, in the direction of this gradient, would be the magnitude of the gradient, right, which is gives you essentially the directional derivative of S in these directions, so dS, dL. So that times dL, a spatial displacement, would give you the change in S. And our iconal equation says that the gradient, the magnitude of the gradient of S is n, the index of refraction. So this is equal to n dl. So solving for dl, dl would be ds over n. So imagine we're in a region where n is equal to a constant. So a simple medium. And let's say our surface, S is equal to S0, is a plane. So everywhere on this plane, if we take a step dL, it's going to be equal to dS over N, and N is the same everywhere. So you're going to get the same dL for the same dS. And that would mean everywhere you would move perpendicular to the plane, and you would go to a new surface, S0 plus dS. Well, that's just a description of a plane wave. So you've got this phase front, and it just moves along whatever the direction of propagation is. And of course, this has given us now a physical interpretation of what this S of R function is. It appears to be uh, S of R is equal to a constant is a surface of constant phase of the field. Let's look at another case in a simple medium. Let's say we have a uh, start off with a sphere and we take steps, length dl, and ends everywhere the same. So for a given ds, we get the same dl. And those would now point radially outward from the center of the sphere, same distance. So what would happen? This is our S0 surface. So our New surface, so imagine that's a sphere here, that was terrible. This is our new surface, S0 plus DS, and these are all your little DLs here, which would be the same, would then be a new sphere, which had a greater radius. Or if you turn this around, you could have a sphere that was converging, collapsing. Okay, so that is just a spherical wave. 
Now, if you're in a region where n is not equal to a constant, so an inhomogeneous region, then it's a little more complicated. Say this is your surface S0, and over here you move perpendicular to that surface, corresponding to some ds, and up here you do the same thing. But oh, down here in this region, let's say you've got a big index, and up here you've got a small index. Well, if you've got a small index for a given ds, you're going to get a bigger dl. And therefore, the resulting surface, S0 plus ds, is not simply going to be like you had over in these two pictures where you just move the surface or you just shrink it or expand it. You're actually going to be having a bending of the optical rays that correspond right to the normal to the surface because we know that the direction of the gradient of s is the direction of power flow the pointing vector and therefore you're going to get bending rays which we would expect to get in an inhomogeneous medium now in a medium with an index of refraction n the wavelength is the wavelength in free space divided by n. So in a place where the index is big, the wavelength is small. And in a place where the index is small, the wavelength is relatively big. So what's going on here is, right, we are identifying these sur surfaces as surfaces of constant phase for the field. In a place where the index is big, the wavelength is relatively small. You don't have to go very far to get a significant change in phase, whereas in regions where the index is small, the wavelength is relatively larger, and you've got to move farther to get the same change in phase. So that's what the Iconal equation is telling us. That's our physical interpretation of it. Now we want to derive a differential equation that describes the path that a ray takes when it, as it propagates through an arbitrary inhomogeneous or homogeneous medium. So toward that end, let's start off with a mathematical identity. Uh, we're going to assume V of R is any vector field. And then just V, without an underscore, so not a boldface V, is the magnitude of that vector field. And then U is a unit vector, which is 1 over the magnitude of the field times the field. So just a unit vector in the direction of the vector field. Then we're interested in calculating the derivative with respect to position, or displacement, of the vector field, dV dL. L is a little uh, distance that we step in the direction of the vector field. So that will be, by this the definition of a derivative, the limit as some parameter delta goes to 0 of V at R plus, we take a little step in the direction U, a step of length delta, minus the original V of R, and then divide that by the step length delta. And what we want to show here is that if the curl of V is equal to zero, then this derivative d by dl of V is simply equal to the gradient of the magnitude of V. Now, what is d by dl of V? Well, let's see, V has components, vx, vy, and vz. So let's look at the d by dl of vx, of the x component. Well, we could write that as, right, so a derivative in some direction in space would just be the gradient of that scalar function, the gradient of vx, dot the direction that we're moving in, which is u, the unit vector. And what is that? look like in terms of components. Well, here's the gradient of vx. It's d by dx of vx. And then the y component is d by dy of vx. And the z component is d by dz of vx. 
and we're taking a dot product of that with the unit vector u so that's one over v vx vy and vz and so that would be we got a one over v here we'll put it out in front and then we've got uh, vx times the x derivative of vx plus vy times the y derivative of vx and then we've got vz times the z derivative of vx now what is over here on the right the gradient of v of course the x component of that is the x derivative of v so the x derivative of v v is the magnitude right of the vector field well that would be the x component or the x derivative sorry x component of the gradient x derivative of the magnitude which is the square root of vx squared plus vy squared plus vc squared and what would that be that would be well uh the derivative of of the sum of squares to the one half power would be one half the sum of squares to the minus one half power and then use the chain rule for the inside stuff so this thing to the minus one half power would be one over v and again from the power rule the derivative of something to the one half power would give you a factor of one half so you get one over two v and then we'd have from the chain rule the derivative of all the stuff inside which would be well two vx times the derivative of vx so you get a factor of two which of course is going to cancel oops which of course is going to cancel that factor of two and so then we would have vx times the x derivative of vx plus vy times the x derivative of vy plus vz times the x derivative of vz now we want these to show that these two are the same well we've both got a in both cases a one over v uh, but these are not the same expressions however we're assuming that the curl of v is equal to zero and what are the components of the curl of v the x component is the y derivative of vz minus the z derivative of vy and then the y component is the z derivative of vx minus the x derivative of vz and then the z component is the x derivative of vy minus the y derivative of vx and we said that we're assuming that's equal to zero so if that's equal to zero let's see let's look at this right here that tells us that the z derivative of vx is equal to the x derivative of vz and for this component to be zero that tells us that the x derivative of vy is equal to the y derivative of vx so let's look at uh, well let's see first of all this this term is the same as that term so we could cancel those on both sides it's just vx dx d by dx of vx but here we got vy the y derivative of vx here we got y the x derivative of vy but the x derivative of vy is equal to the y derivative of vx so those are the same and likewise over here we got vz the x derivative of vz x derivative of vz though is equal to the z derivative of vx so those are also equal and so indeed the two sides are equal so we have established this result that if the curl of a vector field is equal to zero then the derivative of that vector field with respect to distance along the direction of the vector field is just equal to the gradient of the magnitude of the vector field so now let's assume that r of l represents the position of a ray so ray position after propagating 
a distance L from some initial point. Then U is a unit vector in that direction would be just dr dl and r is then a position so the rate of change of position is a length divided by the length of the of the uh, change and that would just be then a unit vector and we know from what we've already said before that the gradient of the optical path the gradient of s is equal to the magnitude of it is n the index of refraction so the gradient of s over n is a unit vector and the direction of the propagation of energy the direction of an optical ray is in the direction of the gradient of s so this is a unit vector in the direction of propagation Now, let's let the vector field V be equal to the index of refraction times this unit vector, dr dl. Well, index of refraction times this unit vector would then also be equal to just the gradient of S. Now, in this case, what is the curl of V? Well, it's the curl of the gradient of S, but a vector identity tells us that the curl of the gradient of a scalar is always equal to zero. Now how about scalar v, which is the magnitude of this vector field? Well, the magnitude of the gradient of s is for, by the iconal equation is just equal to the index of refraction n. And so from the equation we derived on the previous board, the rate of change with respect to distance L of this vector field V, which is n dr dl, is equal to the gradient of the magnitude of V, but the magnitude of V is n, so this is equal to the gradient of n. And then using this definition of this unit vector, we can write this. The derivative with respect to L of index refraction times the unit vector in the direction of the ray propagation is equal to the gradient of the index of refraction. And that is then our desired differential equation uh, for an optical ray. tells us how the direction of ray propagation changes with propagation along the path. So let's look at a simple case. If n is equal to a constant, well then for this derivative, the n comes out, it's a, it's a constant, and of course the gradient of a constant is equal to zero. So we would just get the equation then that the derivative with respect to position on the path of the unit vector is equal to zero. So what does that tell you? Rays go in a straight line in a simple medium. So now let's uh, imagine we're here are our X and Z coordinates and we've got a ray propagating at some angle theta. And this is a medium where the index refraction is a function only of z. Our vector position is just the x and z coordinates. And a unit vector in the direction of propagation would just be using trig on this uh, angle theta. Would The x component would be the sine of theta, and the z component would be the cosine of theta. Then our equation, derivative with respect to length along the path of 
index of refraction times the unit vector in the direction of propagation. Oops. Would be equal to the gradient of the index of refraction. Well, the index of refraction has no x dependence, so that component would be zero. And then the, for the z dependence, well, you just have dn dz. So let's look at the uh, x component of this equation. That would say the rate of change uh, with distance along the path of n of z times the sine of theta would be equal to zero. Well, that is just Snell's law. Oops. Because if the rate of change of this thing is zero, that means that n of z times sine of theta is equal to a constant. Of course, that just, again, is a version of Snell's law. Index refraction times the sine of the angle of propagation remains constant. And then the, uh, the other component would be derivative with respect to position uh, length along the path of n of z times the cosine of theta would just be the z derivative of the index of refraction. And if the angle was very small, well, cosine of theta is about equal to 1, and, and then dl, the distance, would be basically just dz, and this would just say d by dz of n is equal to d by dz of n, so it would become trivial in that case. But the first one would give you Snell's Law. Let's use these ideas to analyze ray propagation in so-called step index fibers. So imagine we have a situation where we have here is the z direction, the optical axis. Here's the x direction. And we've got here an index refraction, which is n0 outside this fiber, and is equal to n, which is greater than n0 inside the fiber. So this is represents a cross section of a would be a, a cylindrical fiber. And now imagine a ray propagating like so, striking that surface. If you had a reflection, it would go off in this direction. This would be so sort of angle theta. This here would be the incidence angle for reflection at this surface. And of course that would be by well, the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection, that would be the same angle coming off there. And so this would also be the same angle theta. If you had some refraction into this second region with index n0, that would go off at some angle here, theta, such that this angle there would be theta transmission. And those would be represented by, well, let's see. The incidence angle at the surface is related to the angle of propagation theta by, because the sum of them has to be equal to 90 degrees, because this is a right triangle. So theta incidence is just 90 degrees, or pi over 2 radians, minus theta. And then you've got Snell's law at this surface, n times the sine of the angle of incidence is equal to the out outer uh, index and zero times the sine of the angle of transmission and so solving that you get that the angle of transmission is equal to the inverse sine of n over n zero times the sine of the angle of incidence and of course, if uh, you try to take the inverse sine of a number that's bigger than one, you're not going to get a real number. There's no real solution for that. All real angles have a sine that is no bigger than one. So if n over n zero 
times the sine of theta incidence is greater than one, then you get no transmission. There's no solution for the transmitted field and you get what's called total internal reflection. So this entire ray just gets reflected. And of course, the same thing by symmetry will happen down here at this, this surface, and it will just go on following the zigzag pattern forever inside the ray. And so this occurs, we can define, use this to define the so-called critical angle, theta critical, will be when this is exactly equal to one, that's the inverse sine then of n0 over n, which because n is greater than n0, this is a number less than one, so that's a, a real angle that's less than 90 degrees. And so that's the so-called critical angle. And that leads to what we call total internal reflection. So any ray that's propagating with an angle of propagation theta that's small enough that this angle of incidence is greater than or equal to this critical angle will just propagate and bounce along the, the ray forever and ever. So if theta incidence is equal to theta critical, then theta itself from this equation, theta itself will be equal to pi over two minus theta critical. Now, if we call this delta Z, and this hypotenuse is delta L, then with a little trig, we've got that delta L, well, delta Z would be delta L times uh, the cosine of this angle theta, which is equal to the sine of this angle theta incidence, which we're saying is going to be equal to theta critical. So this would be equal to, therefore, delta Z over the sine of theta critical. All right. So that's just from trig on that right triangle. And what is sine of theta critical? Sine of theta critical is N0 over N. So this is the inverse of that would be N over N0 times delta Z. Now, how much time would it take to uh, propagate along that hypotenuse? Delta T, well, it would be the distance, delta L, over the speed of light in that medium. The speed of light would be the speed of light in free space divided by the index of refraction. So that would be C over N. And therefore, let's see, delta T over delta Z is going to be, we'll have this guy, delta T is N over C times delta L, but delta L is equal to N over N zero times delta Z. Okay, so we want to um, write delta L as N over N zero delta Z, so that gets you your delta T is delta L over C over N, and then we're dividing the whole thing by delta Z. And so that just becomes, reduces to N over C times N over N zero. That's the time it takes per unit length along the optical axis. Of course, if theta is equal to zero, then you're just propagating in a straight line down the optical axis. And in that case, delta T over delta Z would just be N over C, right? one over the speed of light. That would be the time it would take to go a unit distance if you're going in a straight line. So this is the time it takes to go uh, a unit distance along the z-axis if you're following this uh, path at the critical angle, and this is if you're going just directly down the z-axis. So these are going to be different, and they, they differ by a factor of n over n0, right? this ratio of these two indices, 
since n is bigger than n0, that's a, this number is bigger, that just tells you it takes longer to go along this uh, sloped path than it does to go straight. But now here's the significance of that. That means if we put a field into this step index fiber, that field will generally have, we can think of it as consisting of rays traveling at every possible direction. Uh, and the rays that travel such that the angle theta gives an incidence angle at this interface of uh, greater than or equal to the critical angle will continue to propagate down the fiber. And so what's going to happen is if you have a pulse, some of the components of that pulse are going to travel with this time delay, and some of the other components will travel with this time delay and all the time delays in between. And so that leads to the phenomenon that we call dispersion. So here's the z-axis. Suppose we want our rays to propagate a distance l along the z-axis. Well, we're going to have one ray that propagating along this, uh, this uh, sloped path. And that's going to take some time, let's say, big T1. And then at the other extreme, we've got rays that are propagating along a straight path. And that's going to take time T2. And we've said that then that T1 would be n over n0 times n over c. That's the time per unit length along the z-axis, and then times the length, l. And for the straight ray, well, that's just n over c. That's the time per unit length times l. And the difference of those, delta t, t1 minus t2, will be the, uh, the difference in time for the rays that follow those two different paths. So let's work out what that is. Let's look at delta t over the length l. So we're going to divide both sides by the, uh, the l here. And so that's just going to be n over c in both cases. We'll factor that out, n over c. And then in the first case, you've got a factor of n over n0. And for the second one, it would just Leave a, leave a 1. Okay, so that minus that. And let's see, that's equal to n over c. And we're going to write this thing in parentheses as n minus n0 over n0. And of course, that is n over n0 minus 1. And then that's equal to n over c. And then let's call this guy up here. Delta n, the difference in the indices of fraction in the two different regions. So that's going to be delta n over n0. And now, if we assume the difference between n and n0 is very small, then we can just cancel those, and this is about equal to delta n over c. And that's that would assume that delta n is very small relative to n0, meaning the difference of n and n0 as a fraction of either is very small. Okay. So now imagine that we're using this fiber to transmit a pulse. Tx here represents the transmission. That pulse has a width of tau. And then at the other end, we receive Rx here from the path that followed this uh, zigzag pattern uh, that comes in at a time big T1. But for the other rays that follow the straight pattern, well, it comes in at some time uh, T2. And that difference here is delta t. So what does this mean? If we send a pulse with width tau received pulse width will be tau b and what will that be? Well it'll be the width of one pulse plus this delta t. So it will be 
tau plus delta t. And therefore, your maximum bit rate, because you can't have bits overlapping, so that means the bit rate that you could achieve with that would just be 1 over the pulse width, or the bit width, tau b, oops, which is 1 over tau plus delta t. Uh, and you can make that smaller by making the original pulse smaller and smaller, but the limit of that, of course, would be 1 over delta t, which is, what do we get here? Delta t uh, over L is about equal to delta n over c. So this guy would be approximately c over L delta n. And that sets a limit on the maximum bit rate. And so um, if we think of the bit rate, in bits per second, as representing the communication bandwidth, B, and we multiply th both sides of this by L, by the length, we get the bandwidth times the length is about, or is limited by, really, um, C over delta N. We call that the bandwidth distance product. So that sets a fundamental limit on how fast you can communicate over a given distance using a step index fiber. Now you might say, well, just let delta n get really small, go to zero, and this could be arbitrarily large. True. Uh, however, of course, if delta n is equal to zero, then you don't have any, any difference between the two regions of the fiber, and the rays would just propagate it off to infinity. And so for practical purposes, you, you can't make delta n arbitrarily small. So this will then fundamentally set a practical limit on the band bandwidth length product for a step index fiber. It is possible to fabricate so-called graded index fibers. So a graded index fiber would be one where the index or a fraction follows a continuous gradation of value. So if here's x, let's see, like this minus a, and uh, this plus a, and we might have a variation that would look something like this. All right, this is some value n0, this is a value n1, and this is whole thing is n of x, where n of x is equal to n1 times 1 minus delta times x over a squared for x in magnitude less than or equal to a, so that's in this region. This is a quadratic index profile, and it's equal to n0 for the magnitude of x is greater than a. We're here to make this uh, continuous. You must have that delta is equal to n1 minus n0 over n1. Uh, and then that makes this expression that x is equal to a, 1 minus delta, 1 minus this is just, well, n1 over n1 is 1, so 1 minus that is 0, and then minus minus n0 over n1 times n1 would be n0, and then it's, it's continuous. So, now imagine putting together a system that has fibers with this type of variation. So here's z and x. So this is minus a, and this is plus a, and this would really represent a cross-section of a cylindrical waveguide with this, uh, this index profile, where this, instead of x, would be the cylindrical coordinate rho. And in here, we've got some 
ray and is propagating with some unit vector u corresponding to an angle of propagation of theta. And this is vector position as a function of distance along the path. So let's see what the differential equation for this ray would be. So the unit vector would be dx dl is the x component, and then dz dl would be the z component. And in terms of the angle theta, these would be, the x component would be the sine, and the z component would be the cosine. And then our differential equation says that the derivative with respect to distance of the index of refraction times unit vector in the direction of ray propagation is equal to the gradient of the index. And that's going to have two equations, one for the x component, one for the z component. The x component is going to look like this. d by dl of, well, in this case, this is a n of x index variation times the sine of theta is equal to, so the x component of the gradient is the x derivative of n, that's dn dx, and then the z component would be d by dl, n of x cosine theta would be, well, there's no z derivative for this n of x, so that would just be equal to zero, the, that component. If this is dz, a little distance along the z-axis, and this is dx, a little distance along the x-axis, the total displacement, dl, would be this hypotenuse. This angle here would be the angle of propagation of the ray. Now, if we're in the paraxial approximation where we can apply the small angle approximation, sine theta is approximately equal to theta. Cosine theta is approximately equal to 1. So, let's see, dz would be dl times cosine theta, but that would mean that um, in this approximation, dz would just be equal to dl for a very small angle. These are essentially the same lengths. Then our differential equation, d by dl becomes d by dz of n times sine theta, but sine theta is replaced by theta. And what would that be? Let's see. Well, uh, in our problem, n is only a function of x, so that's a constant. We can factor it out and then divide by it. All right, so we'll have n, and then we're left with d theta dz. And the right-hand side of our equation is the gradient of n, and the x component of that is dn dx. So that's the x component of our differential equation. And so dividing by n, we get that d theta dz is 1 over n dn dx. Now, in this triangle, the tangent of theta, which in the small angle approximation is equal to theta, would be opposite over adjacent, dx over dz. And therefore, d theta dz here would be the derivative of this with respect to z. Well, that would just be the second derivative of x with respect to z, and we've said that's 1 over n dn dx. And what is that for our quadratic profile? Uh, well, n is equal to n1 times 1 minus delta x over a squared. And then the derivative of that, well, you just get 2 minus 2 delta x over a squared, right? Because the x squared derivative would be 2x. And so the derivative would give you minus 2 delta x over a squared. Uh, 
And if delta, which is equal to n1 minus n0 over um, n1, as is typically the case in practice, is much less than 1. In other words, this difference in indices is relatively small. As we saw for the step index fiber, that's what you need to get a decent bandwidth distance product. Well, then this term down here would be negligible compared to 1, and this would be approximately just uh, minus 2 delta over a squared times x, which we will define to be minus omega squared x, so that omega squared is 2 delta over a squared. So putting that all together, here we've got the second derivative of x with respect to z. And, oops, and over here on the right, we've got minus omega squared x. Let's move that to the left because plus omega squared x is equal to zero. And that is the equation of a sinusoid. So let's look at solutions of the form x is equal to a, oops, sine omega z. That's a solution of this equation. And that would look like maybe something uh, like, let me do it like this here. Here would be one solution, and this would be one that had an amplitude of A1. Of course, this is the period here. Well, that L is equal to 2 pi over omega. When Z is equal to that value, then this becomes sine of 2 pi, and we've gone through one period. But we could also have another solution, which uh, would look like this, with a bigger amplitude. And that would be, say, one with this amplitude of A2. So we have all these different types of solutions, rays traveling at different angles, that will give you sine waves with the same spatial period, L, uh, but different amplitudes. So I might think, well, then we would get dispersion again, because these different ray paths would take different amounts of time. And so if we had lots of rays traveling at different initial angles, and this would be your initial theta initial angle there, which would be, well, essentially that angle is tangent of that is, is dx dz, and in the small angle approximation, that would be the derivative of this with respect to z, evaluated z is equal to zero, derivative of the sine omega z is cosine omega z, and then chain rule brings out an omega, cosine of zero is one, so this would just be a times omega, so different angles would give you different amplitudes A, um, and it might seem like we would still have dispersion. After all, a ray that has a bigger amplitude here has to travel farther than a ray with a smaller amplitude. However, as we show in detail in the PDF lecture notes, the total time for any ray, regardless of its amplitude, is the same, N1L over C, and this is to approximation and that is accurate to second order in the amplitude A. And the reason is because, remember, in this quadratic uh, index, graded index profile, you have up here at large values of absolute value of X, you've got relatively small N, and near the optical axis, you've got large n values. So these high amplitude rays go farther, but they go farther spending a lot of time in regions where the index refraction is smaller. So the speed of light in the material there is faster. Whereas the smaller amplitude rays, uh, they spend their time 
in regions where the index is larger, so they go slower. And that those two effects, precisely, at least the second order in A, cancel out. And so in a so-called graded index or GRIN fiber to that level approximation, they have no dispersion. And they allow much higher um, bandwidth space products, right? There's, it's, it's only the second order in A. If you go to higher order, it, uh, you don't get the same effect. So there's still some limitations, but they give you much higher bandwidths at the expense of having to fabricate this quadratic index profile. Now we want to talk about something called the opto mechanical analogy. And to motivate this, let's suppose here's the x-axis and there is the z-axis and this is some solid interface there and I draw path coming in at an angle theta sub i and another path going out away from this interface at an angle theta sub i. And I ask, what does that represent? Well, since this is an optics class, we probably the first thing that would come to mind is this is just reflection of an optical ray off of a mirror. And the angle of reflection is equal to the angle of incidence. And it could represent that. Uh, but another thing it could represent would be, say, if this was a particle, an ideal uh, ball, say, bouncing off a wall. It would also satisfy the same relationship. And so that simple analogy there between optics and mechanics motivates us to look into this a little bit deeper. So let's start with uh, Newton's law of motion, F is equal to ma, force is mass times acceleration. And with momentum equal to mass times velocity, then the time derivative of momentum would be m times the time derivative of velocity is acceleration, so this would be equal to force. Force is equal to the time derivative of momentum. And imagine we have a conservative system so that energy is conserved. And in that case, force can be represented as minus the gradient of a scalar function called the potential. So there's a potential there, potential energy. Now let's go back to our differential equation for rays that we derived. d by dl of index of refraction times unit vector in the direction of ray motion is equal to the gradient of the index of refraction. And let's write vector momentum is equal to magnitude of momentum, scalar p, times the unit vector in the direction of momentum, which would give us that u is equal to just the vector momentum over its magnitude. Then Newton's law looks like this the time derivative of momentum times this unit vector is equal to minus the gradient of this potential function. So these two left-hand sides look somewhat analogous, but here you've got a time derivative, here you've got a space derivative. And we could say, well, a little bit of time dt would be equal to a little distance dl divided by the velocity. So that this then can be written as d by dl of p u and with uh, 1 over d dt being v over dl and then dividing by v on both sides we'd have minus 1 over v gradient of potential. Okay, so now this looks fully analogous to that. Uh, but the right-hand sides are a little bit different, but let's continue on here. Total energy, if it's a conservative system, is E is equal to the kinetic energy 
plus the potential energy. And the kinetic energy is P squared over 2M. And that's just one half m v squared if you use p as mass times velocity plus the potential energy and so from that you can write the potential energy is the total energy minus the kinetic energy p squared over 2m so what is the uh, gradient of potential energy in fact, let's do minus the gradient of potential energy times 1 over V. So we would have minus 1 over V times the gradient of this expression. E is a constant, so the gradient is 0. And then the, the gradient of this, well, using the uh, chain rule, that would be minus 2P times the gradient of P. That would be minus, and that... 2 for 2p would cancel with that p, so that would just leave you minus p over m times the gradient of p. Which would be, well, see here, mv, that's the magnitude of the momentum, because this is the magnitude of velocity, not the vector velocity, and the minus signs cancel out. So that would just be momentum, magnitude of momentum over magnitude of momentum. That would just leave the gradient of p, and therefore we end up with this analogy. Here's the equation from optics, differential equation for the path of an optical ray. The derivative with respect to distance along the path of the index of refraction times the unit vector in the direction of motion of the path of the ray is equal to the gradient of the index of refraction. For mechanics, we have the equation that the derivative with respect to distance along a path of momentum times the unit vector in the direction of the particle motion is equal to oops, the gradient of the magnitude of momentum. And these are entirely analogous. In one case, we've got the index of refraction. In the other, we've got momentum. And therefore, if up here solving for the magnitude of momentum, P is equal to the square root of 2M E minus U. If that function of position is the same as an index of refraction variation with position, then the path of optical rays will be exactly analogous to the path of particles. And so that is the optomechanical analogy. So very interesting result. And later, we'll see that it implies that when we replace the classical geometrical optics picture by a wave picture for, uh, for light, uh, that there will be an implication that we should also replace the classical mechanics picture for the motion of a particle by so-called wave mechanics, or what's now more commonly called quantum mechanics. So we'll come to that later in the course.